This is an arhu. This is a yangqin. This is a pipa. They're all part of a diverse family of traditional Chinese string instruments, which all have a rich history and powerful sound. Oh, what was I going to say? One of the big misconceptions about Chinese music is that it's really boring and that you can only play, um, you know, very slow, very sad songs. Which is not true because the string instruments are a lot more versatile than you think. They can produce a lot of sounds and evoke many different types of emotions with very different styles of music. My friends who don't play, they think this is too old. They want to listen to the so-called new stuff, like maybe pop or rock music. It's important to know a lot of genres of music, not just Western music, not just Chinese music, but all kinds of music. But in the end, the kind of music they create is still a universal language that brings people together because music is not really something you really have to learn, but you can feel emotions from just listening to it. I'll start. So the origins of a lot of these instruments come from outside influences that are opened up by global trade. So that includes the Silk Road, which helped to connect China to a lot of outside influences. And that's actually how all three of the instruments you see today were introduced to China and became our well-known traditional Chinese instruments. Among some of the trades were the Persian lutes, and those are what inspired the Chinese pipa. The pipa is one of the oldest Chinese musical instruments. At some point, it was even crowned the king of all Chinese musical instruments. So that's really awesome. The Arhu is, I think it was only known much about until the later Tang Dynasty. I like history. I like traditional stuff. It's actually love to be more, to be more precise. The Arhu is about a thousand years old, but it can also be played with other genres of music, for example, pop songs. The Yangtze has about 400 years of history, and I think it was heavily influenced by Persian culture because they had a similar um, instrument called the Santur. Before someone wants to play the instrument, you first have to understand the amazing structure of the instrument. Look at this. The lower frets of the pipa are all made of bamboo, and then the upper frets here are made of wood, um, ivory, or buffalo horns. Oh, this is made of wood and more wood. A lot of people, the first moment they look at the yangtzean, they immediately say, wow, there's a lot of strings. There's actually 144 strings on this instrument. This is actually widely regarded as the Chinese piano because it covers the widest range of notes in pretty much the entire Chinese instrument family. So this covers about four to five octaves. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. So that's one octave. Over here, we have the packs. We use the packs to tune the erhu. Here, we have the qian jin. It's here to support the strings. For the strings, we use it to touch on as we move the bow along. The sounds come from the window in the sound box. To play the pipa, you need these nails. These are plastic nails that I've taped onto my fingers. I'm pretty sure um, you can't actually use your nails because the first string is made of some sort of metal. So it's really rough on your nails and you can hurt your fingers too. So the two sides, which I'll open up now, are actually where you tune the notes. So you use it to kind of turn the metal rods on this side so you can tune all the individual strings that you see here. Yeah, that's pretty much it for this instrument structure. The instruments may all come from strings, but don't let that fool you. They have totally different sounds. Basic techniques, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the P pa is actually named after the two most basic techniques played, which is the P of the plucking forward and the Pa of the plucking backwards. But now we also call it Tan and Tiao. Yeah, you try doing like that. Exactly. And then another very basic technique would be our Luan Zhi. It's 
basically the same as doing a tan, just like you do it on one, two, three, four, and then you end it with a five. Like. Yeah, <laughs> you did it, whoa! The roshian is similar to a vibrato, so you sort of just shake the string a little bit. The tui lai in is when you actually pull out the string, and it could be to hit another note or just to pull it out. So there's also a slightly more advanced technique, xiao xuan. So it's sort of when you would pull your second string over your first string, and then play them um, at the same time to create a sound that sounds a lot like cymbals. The yang qin is mainly struck by a bamboo mallet, which is what I'm holding right now. You also sometimes see plucking of the strings with the mallet. And very, very occasionally, you might also see plucking of the strings with your fingers. And last but not least, you also often see melodies played with the back of the bamboo mallet like that. Usually the reason why we would sometimes use the back of the hammer is to produce a louder sound, usually for the melody. So sometimes you would see it in conjunction with your right hand using the normal rubber side of the hammer playing an accompaniment. Something like that. There's also the tremolo, which is called the Luen Yin in Mandarin. So this is very important because unlike the Erhu, for example, in the Yang Qin, you are unable to produce a very long continuous note at once. So the tremolo is used to emulate a long note. <laughs> Let's go slow. So right, left, right, left. And after you hit the note, like, Make sure you get some kind of re rebound. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a stick, it's a rebound. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. We'll destroy the young scene at this rate, okay. Yeah. yeah. You're actually really not bad at this. <laughs> the most basic way to ever play the Ahu is to just bowing the bow on the string. Your left hand is pressing on the strings to make different sounds. Let's say when you're pressing it here, it makes a certain sound. When you're pressing it here, it makes a totally different sound. There's this one technique called the vibrato. So basically, you move your knuckle on the string, like a little chicken like eating a rice. Now here uh, is a more fast, a more intense kind of vibrato. The Arhu is amazing at imitating sounds and there's a few main ways to play it. This technique will sound a little bit like horses galloping. The Erhu can also make some sounds of birds chirping. So the amazing thing about these Chinese instruments is the emotional range that each of them can express. So for example, there's this one piece that I really like, which expresses sadness and farewell and longing feelings. There's also the more powerful pieces that paint battle scenes or like war. And usually this could even be adapted from stories or historical events, etc. piece, you would see me hitting the notes at the same time. So it produces a louder and more powerful sound. So it makes it a lot stronger as compared to the first set piece where I would play singular notes and they're a lot softer. Yeah, that's most of the main basic factors that affect the mood.
music is actually like about expressing feelings. If you want a sad feeling, you can go slow. If you want a war or a, or a strong feeling, you can just go fast, very fast. This part is just talking about horses galloping, which goes to show you're going very fast or you're very happy, you're feeling excited. I think it's actually quite amazing that music can express all types of emotions. Like, for example, when you hear a piece, you may get like this feeling, like you know what it's talking about, but you can't express two words. For this piece, it's more sad, more melancholic. It kind of reminds me of meditation, sometimes even sad memories. The techniques that I was using in order to make the song more sad was the vibrato is, was actually more clear, more intensified. When you get sad or angry, I usually tend to my earth hole. It's some kind of like a meditation process. So like, by playing it, it's as if I'm talking to an instrument and then the instrument will be like, yo, I understand you. I think it's a really celebratory song because the tempo is very upbeat and a lot of the techniques, they aren't necessarily so um, angry. It's more of a happy and lighthearted tune. When I'm playing it, my teacher told me to sort of envision there being all sorts of trading going on and that there will be a lot of colours and smells and dance and music too. So whenever I think of it, I think like, oh, it's a festival. And because there's a lot of tui la ing in this, um, the combination of the tui la ing and the lun chui sometimes, it can make it sound very mysterious almost. So I think it's a combination of it being festive and a little bit mysterious, that gives it a really enchanting feeling. The beauty of the many different types of emotions or moods of these pieces is often best expressed when many different instruments come together, put in their strengths and then um, present the entire piece in a very dynamic, but yet still harmonious way. Right before I go to stage, I always feel very nervous like, oh, I'm going to be a disappointment to everybody, what am I going to do? But then when I go on stage, and then when I hear like everybody just cheering me on, it actually builds the motivation. The feeling is really, really great, but I can't explain it. You just feel the music. It's like a time traveling machine that brings you back in the past. Especially traditional songs brings you inside the story. I think playing an ensemble is actually really interesting and it's really fun. And I get to learn a lot because it's not only me playing. By hearing the other people play, I can also learn from them what did they get right and what did I basically get wrong. Yeah, that definitely feels a lot more different than just playing the melody alone as a soloist. It's like 
I'm not alone. At least, if people wanna make fun of me liking Chinese music, I'm not alone. There's another person who likes Chinese music. I guess learning a new instrument is exactly about getting out of your comfort zone, and it helps me to be more embracing and accepting to new things that I'm not used to, and help me actually get to know them and learn them better. Thank you.